Hello everyone, Matt from Model Minutes and welcome back to the workbench for another unboxing. Today we're looking at another vintage classic, but this time it is a dogfight double set featuring the Fokker DR1 and a Bristol F2B from Airfix. So join me as I take a look inside the box and see what we've got. So starting off on the front of the box, we've got this very exciting image, which was drawn by Roy Cross, I'm pretty sure. Yep, Roy Cross, featuring the Bristol F2B and the Fokker DR1 in combat somewhere over France. Up here it tells us it's a dogfight double, so you've got two planes in this set. And down here we have an item code, A02141V, V for vintage. It's 172nd scale, and it's part of the Vintage Classics range. So we will have a quick look on the side of the box, and we have some information here in different languages, a Cartograph logo, which tells us the transfers are made by Cartograph, and they should be absolutely top notch. We have some information here that this was made in India. The model design and tooling dates from 1957, the illustration from 1965, and the pack that we have here is 2023. So this is a this year release. If we flip over to the other edge, it tells us some information about the actual uh, conflict these aircraft were used in and the paint schemes that are included in the set. So your Bristol F2B will be 110 millimeters long, 167 millimeters wide, and it contains 33 pieces. The Fokker DR1 is 79 millimeters long, 110 millimeters wide, and contains only 24 pieces. Interestingly, and uh, I know this is a rebox of a dogfight double set that was in the range. I think this was released originally in like 1973 um, or even before that. There might have been a 1960s version as well. The pack illustration was by Roy Cross in 1965. So I imagine that would be the time when this first was released as a dogfight double set. The thing about this is that if you look on here, your Fokker DR1 was... Um, a frontline aircraft. It was flown famously by Manfred von Richterhofen, uh, and this was in March 1918. However, the Bristol F2B featured in this set is part of the Home Defence Squadron in Essex in September 1918. So, by that logic, technically these two aircraft would never have physically fought against each other one-on-one -on -one during the First World War, because this aircraft was in the United Kingdom and this aircraft was not. And they're at different time periods. One was in March, one was in September. So an interesting um, subject, but technically not in a dogfight kind of condition. They aren't adversaries that would have necessarily fought against each other for these specific aircraft. With that little uh, gripe out of the way, Let's just finish off on this edge here. So we had Humbrol paint color callouts. Naturally, you can use any other brand that you want to. And we have one flying hour. That is a token, cut it out, keep it. And you can use that against more kits if you are a member of the Airfix Club. Alternatively, send it to Models for Heroes and they can use your coupons to do their charitable work. Down here it says it's a skill level two, so it's not going to be the easiest kit in the world. It's being vintage, it's also biplane, so it can be a little bit fiddly and it's probably an accurate assessment. So let's get into the box, he says, easier said than done. And first off, we're met with some vintage display stands. Let's have a look at these. Let's have a look at these bad boys. It's been a while since we've had um, display stands in Airfix kits. Yes, I know the new starter sets have them specifically designed, but these are the old um, Airfix display stands, which used to come as standard in the majority of Airfix aircraft. So you can see we've got the old Airfix logo on there, and it's a two-part stand. The arm goes into the base, and then your little slot in the bottom of the plane will take this hook type attachment at the top. Quality wise, they look pretty decent. The, the plastic is mostly crystal clear. Naturally, they are a bit old. There is a tiny bit of flash in a few places and there are a few blemishes, but uh, generally not too bad. I do actually have another set of stands in the stash somewhere, which I need to dig out and do a video on. So they don't not exist. Airfix just don't include them that often in um, their kits because it's a cost saving um, 
exercise. The argument being that the majority of modelers don't build their planes to display on a stand, they display them with the wheels down uh, and put them on their shelves like that. So these just end up being wasted. Personally, I love to display my aircraft in a flying pose. We'll have a look at the plastic parts in a minute. We have our instructions, and there should be some transfers in here somewhere. There they are, put them to the side. So, normal format from Airfix, information about the actual aircraft on the front, hints and tips about washing your parts down the bottom there. Flipping over, some more safety instructions, and a key to the icons we will encounter. So first up is the Bristol F2B fighter, and the instructions are based on older uh, instructions which came with the sets some time ago, but they've just been updated slightly to um, make them a bit more modern. However, as you can see, they are a little cluttered. There is a lot going on in each step. So we start off by assembling our two fuselage halves. We glue our halves of our pilot and gunner, because there's only the top half of them, into their mounting points. There's no chairs to speak of. There is a rear machine gun. There is an indication here not to glue it. Um, don't know why. I guess if you pop it incorrectly, it can go up and down, it traverse up and down, but uh, I'm not too sure about that. Personally, I'll just glue it in and call it a day. Add your tail surfaces and possibly what our engine exhausts here. Then we move on to adding our lower wing and all of the various support struts. Then we add our top wing at a 14 degree angle from the lower wing and then also our engine. And if you're careful and you don't glue the propeller in but you glue the pin to the back of the engine then you should have a freely rotating prop and then we add our tail skid and our landing gear and that is it it's only four steps not a big kit to build um how many parts was it it was uh 33 only 33 parts in this kit so if you just wanted to knock this up in an hour um you could within reason however biplanes tend to have rigging and there's no indication on here um i know airfix do it with their other uh, biplane kits sometimes is they indicate where the rigging goes but it tends to be on the more newly tooled kits on this however they've just ignored the fact there is rigging so yeah i might be tempted to just build this without the rigging um because i hate rigging i hate it, it, it biplanes really put me off because of because of rigging and the irony is that I only bought this kit because I wanted a free kit from Airfix. So they had a special deal on their website recently that if you spend £30 or more, you'll get a free kit. And this was the free kit. So I, well, actually, I'll show you. I bought this. I bought this one. I know we're going off on a tangent. I'll be right back to this kit in a minute. I bought this one. I bought this one. And I bought some uh, Humbrol spray paint. I think it was. Let me check. I bought grey primer because. The grey primer is really good and I, I love how it, it goes down and uh, the paints go on top of that really nicely. And I bought aluminium as well. Um, I can't really remember why I bought aluminium, probably because I was going to use it on this. Uh, but I do have a, a silver as well, so it swings around about. So I bought these to get the free kit. And bearing in mind, I don't like rigging on biplanes because I find it to be such a pain. What, Matt, you may ask, was the free kit that I wanted? Well... It was this. <laughs> Another biplane with rigging. I don't know. I don't know. This is a more recent tool, though. This isn't an old tool. But it's a 148 uh, Tiger Moth. Again, rigging. Don't know. May or may not leave it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've got a problem. I have an actual problem where I buy too many kits. I buy too many. Anyways, back to this kit. No rigging annotated on here. Um, yeah, I might just build it and not bother putting it on. It's my kit at the end of the day, and I'll probably just do what I want. So, painting instructions then. Scheme A, which is the Bristol Fighter, there is no other option for this Bristol Fighter. And we have a olive drab uppers, cream colored lowers, gray uh, engine area, and our machine gun is in a metallic color. So a fairly simple paint scheme. You could potentially do that with brushes. Or if you wanted to airbrush, that wouldn't be too difficult to mask. Transfers as well. We've got the roundels on the wings. We've got our ones on the side. And that is pretty much it done. So, yeah, it's nice to see them in full colour because it just makes it easier to understand what we're doing. So on to the Foppa DR1, the triplane, uh, flown by the Red Baron. And it's the same sort of format. Uh, we have our pilot going into the... Well, it's, it sits on a 
bar. There's no cockpit detail in here, so probably would be worth putting the pilots in just to hide the fact there's no cockpit detail. Lower wing gets glued onto the bottom of the fuselage. Then we add our mid wing, machine guns and struts, and the struts go through so that they can glue into the bottom and the top wing. And again, we've got a 17 degree angle there for our wings. Coming on down, we add our tailplane, our engine. And again, if you glue through, so that part of the retaining pin gets glued to the propeller and not to that bit, we should have a rotating prop. And then we add our final little details on the bottom, including the landing gear. And to the best of my knowledge, the Fokker DR1 didn't have much in the way of rigging wires. I think there was just a little bit like on the landing gear just to help keep it a bit more strong. Um, but other than that, it didn't have rigging because it had such small wings and they had, it was the struts and yeah, it was, it was, there was a thing. So this is easier to do without rigging. So all in red, a satin red they've pulled for here, a little bit of black on your wheels and gun metal on your guns and a bit on the engine and a bit of wood color for your chair and the prop and not much in the way of transfers, red crosses, upper and lower on the sides and an identification code for the aircraft. And that would be it. Um, satin, so not quite gloss, but not flat either. Yeah, this part, this one only has 24 parts. So again, a fairly quick build. I'd be tempted just to spray can that in red, call it a day and then pick out all the other colors with a fine brush. Fairly simple to do. And that is the instructions. So let's take a look then at the decals. So cartograph decals, and we have our RAF roundels at the top and our German crosses and things down the bottom. Printing is spot on, no tears, no bleeds. Registration, which is where the red dots are central, so all the, all the colors are lined up perfectly. In the old days, Airfix and other manufacturers still do it now, your red dots would be separate, so you'd put them in the right place because they couldn't guarantee when they printed it that they'd get them in the middle when it was printed. But with Cartograph being such a good manufacturer, these are spot on. And as I've said in other videos, sometimes the transfers cost just as much as the plastic parts to go inside the kit. So that's what you're paying for sometimes is the quality of the transfers. And these are some of the best quality transfers out there. And speaking of the plastic parts, let's take a look in this bag. This just so happens to be the Bristol F2B. So let's take a quick look and see what we've got. Now, obviously bearing in mind, this is a 1950s kind of kit. What can we expect? This is, oh, I've got parts off the sprues. Parts are off the sprues. So, dark gray plastic, which is the more recent um, kind of plastic we've got from Airfix. Slightly flexible, but not a bad thing. And as can be expected, there is some flash. It's a 50s tooling, so there is some flash, which will need cleaning up. Mold quality though is generally okay. There are some scuffs and blemishes on the parts from the age of the tooling, a bit of wear and tear, but on the whole, not too bad. The mold quality is okay. The um, molding finesse is a bit questionable. This machine gun is a very generic representation, for example. The crew figures, you see them there? They don't look too bad. They look usable. Naturally, there is only half of them. And I think they are duplicates. I don't think one is particularly holding a machine gun over the other, or one is particularly flying the plane more than the other. So they look like duplicates to me, which is probably a cost saving method. There is a slight bit of mold misalignment um, on the wheels. For example, you can see that one side is ever so slightly pulled out to the other side. Um, but yeah, not, not terrible, could build up into a reasonable representation. And then the extra spare part, which fell off, is for the landing gear leg. So um, it's nice that it's still there, and we haven't lost it. Fuselage sides then, again, same kind of deal. Uh, we've got a lot of raised details on here, as was the style at the time. Some blemishes and scratches on the plastic, and no detail on the inside. 
and copyright date there in 1957 on the inside. And yeah, plastic doesn't feel as greasy as other offerings I've had from Airfix, so that's not too bad, but it might still benefit from a wash just to make sure there's no dirt or mold release on there. And the, what's this, the upper wing. Yep, that's not much to say. Uh, Ejector pin marks are on the bottom, so once you've got it in place, they're going to be hard to see, but they are a little bit noticeable on camera. So, you know, if you wanted to clean them up, yeah, well, feel free. And then on to the next one, but this time the lower wing has the ejector pin marks on the top, so they may need cleaning up, which is a little bit annoying. If they'd put them on the bottom, um, that would have been smarter, but yeah. It should, I think it should build into a reasonable representation of the Bristol F2B. Uh, no clear parts. Um, I'm not sure if this had a windscreen. Um, I imagine it probably did, but it was probably tiny. So it uh, wasn't worth designing a tool for a clear plastic part, which you could probably make out of uh, a bit of packaging, for example. So yeah, that is the Bristol F2B. Let's very quickly then put all these parts back in the bags and have a look at the Fokker DR1, which I imagine is going to be pretty much the same kind of deal. There we go. At least everything is in on their rele relevant sprues. Same deal, same kind of plastic. We have our landing gear part, tail surfaces, and possibly a lower wing or an upper wing. Not sure. I'll figure it out. That's probably an upper wing because it's got the tail, it's got the control surfaces on it. Mold quality is pretty much exactly the same as the Bristol F2B. Ejector pins are on the bottom on this sprue, uh, whereas on this sprue, you're going to have them in both up and lower, I imagine, uh, on different parts, depending on where you put them in. Um, although that possibly is an upper and that's a lower. So yeah, you're going to have ejector pin marks, a visible um which you may need to tidy up if you're that worried about them. Little bit of flash as a result. Um, there is the generic pilot. There's a generic pilot there from Airfix. So this is sort of showing the period at when this was introduced. Not a particularly time accurate pilot for the Fokker DR1 because he looks like he's wearing a World War II uh, life vest. So. I'd probably use him, but um, not necessarily period accurate. Again, as with the Bristol F2B, the parts have representation of detail, um, but they're not finesse. But then, you know, this is a this is a 1950s kit, so we're not expecting too much with this. And that is pretty much it. You're going to get a representation of the kit, although. Part number nine. Part number nine is missing. Is it still in the bag? I don't see it in there. So what was part number nine? Now we're doing a bit of an investigation. Part nine. Part nine is a support strut for the right-hand side of the engine. And I am missing it. So that's interesting, isn't it? It is possible that I could contact the Airfix spares department and ask them to send out a replacement, which is what I would suggest that you do if you are missing a part. However, it is just to it's a V-shape. It's a V-shape of plastic rods. I probably could manufacture a replacement. It wouldn't take too long with some stretch sprue at the right diameter to replace that. Um, shame that it seems to be missing. I didn't see it fall out. I didn't see it in the bag. So yeah, I do seem to be missing a small part. If it was you, contact spares department and get them to send out a replacement. Me, I'm probably just going to make a make a replacement part when I eventually get around to building this. But yeah, a um, bit disappointing, but let's move on. I think that was pretty much it. So what did we have? Let's round this one up. We had parts for the Fokker DR1, which are old and 
should build into a representation of the kit, but again, don't expect wonders. And it's the same deal with the Bristol F2B. We had some display stands. Fantastic. Fantastic to have these back Airfix if you can bring more back. Uh, in other kits, I, I think the Vintage Classics kits would be the perfect range to bring these back in as well. You know, like the Shooting Star that I've got, uh, the Brewster Buffalo, the Fiat G50. Bring them back. Bring them back in that range. And then, what else do we have? Transfers? Amazing. Love these. Cartograph decals are the best. And then we have our instructions, which seem to be to the usual standard from Airfix. Painting instructions are in colour and they are relatively easy to follow, if a little bit cluttered at times, but yeah, not bad. So, all of which comes contained within a beautifully illustrated box. So, it does say here that the tools were from 1957 and that is accurate. Both of these model kits are from that vintage. They were both released originally in 1957 in um, cardboard headed bags and not as a dogfight set. That wouldn't come until much later, um, potentially, I would imagine, in the 60s, seeing as we've got a date for that artwork. How much would you be looking at paying for this if you wanted to get one? Well, the price on the Airfix website is £10.99. Bearing in mind that you get two models in the box, along with display stands, cartograph decals, and painting instructions which are in full colour, that doesn't seem to be a particularly bad price. It does bring it in line with other kits in the Airfix Vintage range. So maybe one of the better value ones. However, if you were missing uh, one of your parts like I am, then um, you would be contacting Airfix Spares to get a replacement, which potentially would push back your build of the model if uh, that's what you had to do. Probably going to build this straight out of the box, maybe as a back to basics, who knows. Probably going to ignore the rigging because, I mean, look at the amount of rigging on there. That is um, chaotic. But yeah, let me know down in the comments what you thought of my review and if my assessment of this old kit was fair. As always, a quick shout out to my patrons and channel members for the extra support they give the channel. Massive thanks to these guys on screen. If you'd like to join them, take a look at the links in the description to find out more. Additionally, down in the description, you'll find out other ways that you can help support the channel. Alternatively, to help support this channel for free, the best way is to subscribe with notifications turned on so you never miss a modeling upload. Finally though, last thing to say is a massive thanks to you for watching this one, and I'll see you on the workbench again next time.